The sun, a pale disk in the sky, cast a hazy glow over the calm sea off Japan. Hiro's boat, the Seika, glided through the water as he prepared for deep sea fishing. With decades of experience, Hiro knew this was the prime time for finding large fish. His tanned, calloused hands gripped the fishing rod with practiced ease as he trolled through a promising area. Hiro cast his line, trailing it behind the boat. The rhythmic hum of the engine and the occasional seabird call were the only sounds breaking the sea's monotony. Hours passed with no sign of a catch, but Hiro remained hopeful for something extraordinary. Suddenly the rod jerked sharply. Hiro's heart raced as he braced himself against the sudden strain. The tension in the line was immense and Hiro's arms strained to reel in the catch. The boat rocked with each tug, the weight below testing both the line and Hiro's resolve. Sweat beaded on his forehead as he fought to keep the line taut. Minutes stretched into what felt like hours as Hiro battled the unseen creature. The boat pitched and swayed, struggling against the creature's resistance. Hiro's muscles ached, but he pressed on, driven by the desire to discover what was on the other end of the line. His experienced crew watched with awe and concern, knowing this was no ordinary catch. As the strain on the rod peaked, Hiro saw the line slacken and then tighten with renewed vigor. His focus sharpened and his hands moved with precision. Finally, after an eternity of struggle, the shape of the creature emerged from the murky depths. Large and unmistakable, the monstrous figure took form, and Hiro's eyes widened in disbelief. The creature was an enormous squid, its tentacles sprawling like the limbs of some nightmarish beast from a forgotten myth. The squid's body was a dark, sinister hue, its skin glistening with an otherworldly sheen as it undulated in the water. Hero's pulse quickened as he realized the enormity of the challenge he faced. The squid's tentacles, each one thick and curved, reached out with menacing grace, and Hero knew that he was in for the fight of his life. With a final Herculean effort, Hero managed to bring the squid closer to the boat. The creature's massive bulk broke the surface with a splashing heave. And for a moment, Hero and his crew stood stunned, staring at the sight before them. The squid's tentacles were a tangled mass of muscular strength and relentless hunger, each one equipped with rows of robust suction cups. In a desperate bid for freedom, the squid's tentacles began to lash out wildly, their strength palpable even from a distance. One of the tentacles, seemingly aware of the danger, shot out and wrapped itself around the side of the boat. The powerful suction cups clung with a vice-like grip, and the ship shuddered under the impact. Hero's heart pounded as he realized the severity of the situation. Before Hero could react, another tentacle snaked out with alarming speed, wrapping itself around his leg with a crushing force. The sudden vice-like grip sent shockwaves of pain through his body as the squid began to pull him toward the edge of the boat. Hero's breath came in ragged gasps, his mind racing with the urgency of the moment. The squid's tentacle pulled him with almost inhuman strength, and the boat rocked violently as the creature's efforts to drag him into the water intensified. The crew sprang into action, their faces a mixture of fear and determination. They scrambled to find tools and weapons, anything that might help them pry the squid off Hero. Knives were drawn, poles were grabbed, and every available hand was put to work in a desperate attempt to free their comrade. The boat was a cacophony of noise and movement, with each crew member fighting their own battle against the encroaching chaos. The struggle was a frantic, violent ballet. The squid, its beady eyes fixed with unrelenting focus, continued its assault with unyielding persistence. Its tentacles flailed wildly, battering against the sides of the boat with a force that threatened to breach the vessel's integrity. Each strike sent tremors through the ship, causing it to lurch and sway with every impact. Hero, his leg trapped in the squid's grip, fought to maintain his balance. His hands, slick with sweat, struggled to hold on to anything stable as the boat continued to pitch and roll. The pain in his leg was excruciating, and he could feel the cold grip of the squid's suckers digging into his flesh. His thoughts were a blur of adrenaline and fear, his instincts guiding him through the chaos. The crew worked tirelessly, their hands working in unison to pry the squid's tentacles away from Hero. Knives flashed in the dim light, slashing at the tentacle's sinewy grip with fierce determination. The poles were thrust with powerful thrusts, aiming to dislodge the squid's hold. Each strike against the tentacle was met with a violent recoil, but the crew persisted, 
driven by the desperation to save Hero. The struggle continued, the battle between man and squid escalating with each passing moment. The boat groaned under the pressure, its wooden frame creaking with the strain. The crew's efforts were relentless, their movements a chaotic symphony of urgency and determination. Hero's leg felt as though it were being slowly crushed, the pain intensifying with each tug of the squid's powerful grip. Finally, with a final coordinated effort, the crew managed to sever one of the squid's tentacles. The creature recoiled, its grip on Hero loosening just enough for him to escape its clutches. The severed tentacle fell away, its limp, twitching remnants drifting away from the boat. The squid, wounded and enraged, retreated into the depths with a final furious flurry of its remaining tentacles. The boat rocked violently as the squid disappeared beneath the waves, leaving Hero and the crew to grapple with the encounter's aftermath. Hero's leg throbbed with pain, and he collapsed onto the deck, his breaths coming in ragged gasps. The crew, though shaken and exhausted, rallied to his side, their faces etched with relief and concern. The aftermath of the encounter was a mixture of shock and awe. Hero's crew surveyed the damage, their eyes wide with the realization of what they had just survived. The boat bore the marks of the struggle. The battered sides and the scattered tools were evidence of the fierce battle that had taken place. Though battered and bruised, Hero had a newfound respect for the ocean's depths. The encounter with the giant squid had been a reminder of the sea's untamed, unpredictable nature, a force that could turn even the most routine expedition into a fight for survival. On a sunny afternoon in June 2001, Lisa Jennings arrived at Kahuna Cove, a secluded beach in Hawaii. Known for its pristine waters and soft sands, Kahuna Cove was a hidden gem on the island of Oahu. Lisa, a 300-pound woman with an adventurous spirit, had traveled to Hawaii to escape the routine of her daily life and to indulge in the island's beauty. She loved exploring new places, and this beach promised the peace and solitude she craved. Lisa spent the morning exploring the area, taking in the sights and sounds of the tropical paradise. She marveled at the colorful coral reefs visible from the shore and watched as schools of fish darted through the crystal clear water. The beach was relatively empty, with only a few other vacationers scattered along the shoreline. Lisa had always been fascinated by marine life, and Hawaii's waters were home to some of the most magnificent creatures in the ocean. The great white shark, a powerful predator, was among the many species that inhabited these waters. Though rare, sightings of these formidable creatures were not unheard of in the deeper parts of the ocean surrounding the islands. Lisa's adventurous spirit led her to don her snorkeling gear and venture into the inviting waters. She floated on the surface, marveling at the underwater world beneath her. She felt at peace, the gentle waves lulling her into a state of relaxation. As she swam further from the shore, the tranquility of the moment made her feel alive and free. Unbeknownst to Lisa, a great white shark had been lurking in the deeper waters nearby. These sharks, known for their incredible power and sharp senses, were always on the lookout for prey. Their presence in Hawaiian waters was a reminder of the ocean's raw, untamed nature. Lisa swam gracefully, unaware of the danger that was silently approaching. The shark, mistaking her for a seal or other prey, began to close in on her. It was a situation no one could have anticipated, and Lisa was blissfully ignorant of the peril lurking beneath the waves. Nearby, a group of beachgoers enjoyed their day, completely unaware of the unfolding drama in the water. Among them were Mark Roberts, an experienced surfer, and his girlfriend, Emily Sanders, who had been sunbathing on the beach. They had come to Kahuna Cove for its serene atmosphere, hoping to escape the more crowded tourist spots. Lisa continued to swim, taking in the beauty of her surroundings. She was far enough from the shore that the sounds of the beach were distant and muffled, it was just her and the ocean, a moment of pure connection with nature. Without warning, Lisa felt a powerful jolt from below. The force of the impact knocked the breath out of her and sent a shock of pain through her body. Panic set in as she realized she was being attacked by a great white shark. The creature's powerful jaws had clamped down on her leg, and she could feel the sharp teeth tearing into her flesh. The water around her turned red with blood as the shark began to thrash dragging Lisa under the surface. She struggled to free herself, her mind racing with fear and desperation. 
The shark's grip was relentless, and Lisa knew she had to fight with everything she had to survive. On the beach, Mark and Emily heard Lisa's screams. They saw the commotion in the water and realized what was happening. Without hesitation, Mark grabbed his surfboard and rushed into the ocean, calling for help as he went. Emily followed, grabbing a paddle from a nearby kayak. As Mark paddled furiously towards Lisa, he could see the shark's dorsal fins slicing through the water. The sight sent a chill down his spine, but he pushed forward, determined to help. Reaching Lisa, he swung his surfboard at the shark, trying to distract it and force it to release its grip. The shark's powerful body thrashed in response, making the water churn violently. Emily arrived moments later using the paddle to strike at the shark. The combined efforts of Mark and Emily began to take effect, and the shark loosened its grip on Lisa. Blood flowed freely from her wounds and she was barely conscious from the pain and blood loss. The shark, sensing that the fight was not worth the effort, finally released Lisa and disappeared into the depths. Mark and Emily worked quickly to pull Lisa onto the surfboard, using it as a makeshift stretcher. They paddled back to shore as fast as they could, knowing that every second counted. On the beach, other vacationers had gathered, drawn by the commotion. Among them was Dr. Paul Harris, a retired emergency room physician who had been enjoying a quiet day by the water. Seeing Lisa's condition, he immediately took charge, instructing others to call for an ambulance and to bring towels to apply pressure to her wounds. Lisa's leg was badly mauled with deep gashes exposing muscle and bone. Dr. Harris did his best to stabilize her, using his knowledge and the limited resources at hand. The beachgoers formed a human chain to help carry Lisa to the parking lot, where they waited anxiously for the paramedics to arrive. Finally, the sound of sirens pierced the air, and the paramedics arrived. They worked swiftly to stabilize Lisa, loading her onto a stretcher and into the ambulance. As they sped away towards the nearest hospital, those who had witnessed the attack were left to process what they had just seen. The terrifying ordeal was a stark reminder of the dangers that lurked in the ocean's depths. Lisa's adventurous spirit had led her to a near-fatal encounter with one of nature's most powerful predators. The bravery of Mark, Emily, and the others who rushed to her aid showcased the best of human nature in the face of a life-threatening crisis. The icy waters off the coast of Norway shimmered in a crystal-clear blue, intensifying Jake's sense of isolation as he paddled his kayak through the serene expanse. The low-hanging sun cast long shadows across the water, bathing the rugged coastline in a warm golden glow. A faint breeze whispered arctic tales, but Jake's focus was solely on the pod of orcas surfacing in the distance. Their powerful dorsal fins sliced through the water with an elegance that belied their size. Jake had dedicated years to studying marine wildlife, and witnessing orcas in their natural habitat was the pinnacle of his career. He had spent countless hours tracking their migratory patterns and analyzing their behavior from afar, but this close encounter was a rare privilege he intended to savor. The pod moved with synchronized grace, their sleek bodies gliding effortlessly beneath the surface. Jake's heart raced with excitement as he carefully maneuvered his kayak closer, striving to capture the perfect photographs while maintaining a respectful distance. The orcas, aware of his presence, exhibited a mix of curiosity and wariness. They swam in tight formations, their movements fluid and coordinated. The calves, playful and exuberant, occasionally breached the surface, their high-pitched calls echoing through the crisp air. Jake marveled at their social structure and the care the adults showed the young ones. However, amid this captivating spectacle, a large male orca with striking black and white coloration began to exhibit signs of agitation. Unlike the others, this orca circled Jake's kayak with intense focus. Jake's initial concern turned to intrigue. He had read about orcas displaying territorial or defensive behaviors, but this was the first time he was witnessing it firsthand. The male orca's circling grew increasingly aggressive. He swam close to the kayak, retreated, and then returned with greater force. The orca's movements were deliberate, as if gauging the kayak's stability and Jake's reaction. The calm demeanor Jake had maintained began to shift. He was now an active participant in a potentially dangerous interaction. The orca's behavior became more erratic. Each pass bumped the kayak harder, causing it to rock violently. Jake felt the impacts reverberate through the hull, pushing him closer to the edge of stability. 
He gripped his paddle tightly, knuckles whitening as he struggled to maintain control. The once comforting cold of the water now felt hostile, a stark reminder of the potential danger. Jake tried to steady his racing heart as he adjusted his position, facing the orca. He knew sudden movements might provoke the animal further, but the relentless aggression made composure difficult. The orca's dorsal fin cut through the water more frequently, signaling an increasing focus on Jake's kayak. The animal's cold, unblinking eye was fixed on him with unnerving intensity. Without warning, the orca breached the surface with a powerful thrust. Jake's eyes widened as the massive creature's head emerged, jaws snapping with a force that echoed through the air. The kayak, already compromised by the orca's previous bumps, was struck with a violent force. The impact was jarring and Jake was thrown off balance as the kayak tipped precariously. In a split second, the kayak was overturned, and Jake plunged into the icy embrace of the water. The shock of the cold was immediate and all-encompassing, numbing his senses as he struggled to orient himself. The orca, undeterred by the kayak's disarray, continued its aggressive pursuit. Jake could feel the orca's massive body brushing against him, its presence both immense and intimidating. Jake's mind raced as he tried to regain his composure, he knew that maintaining calm was crucial for survival. The water was frigid, its cold seeping through his wetsuit and numbing his extremities. The orca's relentless nudges and the sheer force of its movements made it clear that it was not merely curious. It was intent on either displacing or subduing him. The situation was dire and every second counted. With careful, deliberate movements, Jake began to swim toward the overturned kayak. The orca, sensing his intention, became even more aggressive, its massive body slamming against him with increasing force. Jake could feel the pressure of the orca's body as it nudged him away from the kayak, its breath coming in short, forceful bursts. He had to think quickly and use every ounce of his training to stay alive. The kayak floated a few meters away, its overturned hull partially submerged. Jake fought against the cold and the orca's aggressive behavior as he reached out, trying to grab the kayak's edge. The orca seemed to sense the urgency of his actions, and its aggression intensified. Jake's attempts to right the kayak were met with renewed forceful bumps, and the orca's jaws snapped dangerously close to his legs. Despite his fear and physical struggle, Jake's instincts took over. He grasped the kayak and began the painstaking task of flipping it back over. The orca's behavior was erratic, alternating between aggression and confusion. Jake used all his strength and focus to complete the maneuver and finally right the kayak. Once stable, Jake struggled to pull himself back aboard. The relentless orca continued to press against the kayak, its powerful tail propelling it through the water with intimidating force. Jake moved cautiously but with determination, avoiding provoking the orca while trying to regain control. With one final effort, Jake climbed into the kayak. The orca, recognizing the end of the immediate struggle, ceased its aggression but lingered nearby. Breathing heavily, Jake adjusted his position and grabbed his paddle. The immediate danger had passed, though he remained shaken. Paddling away as fast as he could, Jake's heart raced from the adrenaline of the encounter. The orca followed briefly before rejoining its pod, which receded into the distance. The once inviting icy water now felt hostile, a reminder of the wild's unpredictability. As Jake neared the shore, the waves seemed like obstacles, each ripple a reminder of the near danger. Determined, he paddled on, resolved to share his experience and the lessons learned. The coast brought relief, and Jake felt a deep gratitude and respect for the wild. The orca's aggressive behavior was a stark reminder of nature's power and unpredictability reinforcing the delicate balance between human curiosity and wildlife's raw strength. In August 2005, the sun shone brightly over the crystal-clear waters of the Exuma Cays in the Bahamas. This group of islands, known for their vibrant coral reefs and turquoise waters, was a paradise for tourists seeking adventure beneath the waves. Among the visitors that day was 18-year-old Alex Thompson, a recent high school graduate from Boston, who was on a much-anticipated vacation with his family. The trip to the Bahamas was a gift from his parents, celebrating his upcoming journey to college. Alex had always loved the ocean, and the chance to explore one of the world's most beautiful marine environments was a dream come true. That morning, Alex and his family boarded a boat for a guided snorkeling tour around the coral reefs. 
The guide, a local Bahamian named Terence, was an experienced diver who knew the waters like the back of his hand. He had led countless tours and was familiar with the marine life that called the reefs home, including the harmless reef sharks that often swam nearby. Terence assured the group that these sharks posed no threat to snorkelers, and the group eagerly prepared for their adventure. The boat ride to the snorkeling site was a thrill in itself. The water was so clear that Alex could see the coral formations and schools of fish passing beneath the boat. The islands of Exuma were like jewels scattered across the ocean, their white sand beaches contrasting sharply with the deep blue sea. As the boat anchored near a particularly vibrant reef, the group prepared to enter the water. They donned their snorkeling gear, checked their fins, and slid into the warm embrace of the Caribbean Sea. The underwater world was breathtaking. The coral was alive with color, vivid reds, oranges, and purples, and teeming with life. Schools of fish darted around the group, their scales shimmering in the sunlight that filtered down through the water. Alex was in awe, his heart racing with excitement as he floated above the reef, watching the marine life go about its day. He felt a sense of peace and connection to the ocean that he had never experienced before. As the group swam further from the boat, they marveled at the beauty of the reef, snapping photos with their underwater cameras and pointing out the different species of fish. Terence led the way, guiding them toward a deeper part of the reef where the coral formations were more pronounced. The water was calm and the group felt completely at ease as they explored the vibrant ecosystem below. But the tranquility of the day was about to be shattered. Unbeknownst to the group, a school of fish had been disturbed nearby, attracting the attention of several reef sharks. These sleek predators, though usually uninterested in humans, were drawn by the commotion. More concerning, however, was the presence of two bull sharks, larger and far more aggressive than the reef sharks. Bull sharks are known for their unpredictable nature and are considered one of the most dangerous shark species. The scent of fish and the activity around the reef had brought them in closer, and they were now circling the group, their interest piqued. The water, once so clear and inviting, suddenly felt different. Alex noticed the change first, the way the fish around him seemed to scatter, the subtle shift in the water's energy. He turned to see Terence, who had stopped swimming and was scanning the area with a look of concern. Before Alex could process what was happening, a large shadow passed beneath him, and his heart leaped into his throat. A bull shark, nearly ten feet long, had emerged from the depths, its powerful body gliding through the water with silent menace. The shark circled the group, joined by another of its kind, as the smaller reef sharks followed in their wake. The once peaceful snorkeling trip had turned into a scene of impending danger. Terence signaled for the group to stay close and remain calm, but the situation quickly escalated. One of the bull sharks, sensing an opportunity, charged at Alex its muscular body propelling it forward with terrifying speed. The impact was sudden and brutal, the shark's snout ramming into Alex's side and knocking the snorkel from his mouth. The force of the hit sent him spiraling into the water, disoriented and panicked. As Alex struggled to regain his bearings, he felt a sharp pain in his leg. A small cut, likely from a piece of coral, had opened up, and the scent of blood was now in the water. The sharks, already agitated, became frenzied. The reef shark snapped at the water around Alex while the bull shark circled closer. Their eyes locked on him as if they had found easy prey. Fear surged through Alex as he tried to swim back to the group, but the sharks were relentless. They swarmed around him, their bodies moving with a deadly grace. Alex kicked out with his fins, using them to push the sharks away, but they kept coming. The water churned as the predators closed in and Alex could see the flash of teeth as one of the reef sharks snapped at his arm, narrowly missing him. Terence and the other snorkelers formed a tight circle, their backs to each other as they tried to fend off the sharks. They used their snorkels and flippers to create a barrier, hitting the water to keep the predators at bay. But the bull sharks were persistent, their aggression fueled by the scent of blood and the chaos in the water. The situation was dire and Alex knew that their only hope was to reach the safety of the boat. Terence, recognizing the danger, signaled for everyone to move as one toward the boat. The group swam together, staying close, their movements slow and deliberate to avoid further provoking the sharks. The sharks continued to circle, 
but the group's unity and determination kept them from making another attack. With every stroke, the boat grew closer, but the sharks followed, unwilling to let their prey escape so easily. The adrenaline in Alex's veins pushed him forward despite the pain in his leg and the terror gripping his heart. Finally, they reached the boat and the crew pulled them aboard, their faces pale with fear and relief. As the last person was pulled from the water, the sharks made one final pass, circling the boat before disappearing into the depths. The group collapsed on the deck, gasping for breath, their bodies trembling from the ordeal. Alex looked down at his leg, the small cut now an angry red, but he was alive. The encounter had left him shaken, a stark reminder of the ocean's unpredictable and dangerous side. The sun cast a golden sheen over the serene lake in East Africa, its warm rays creating a mirror-like surface that reflected the lush vegetation surrounding the water. Peter, a seasoned traveler with an adventurous spirit, had spent the better part of the morning exploring the idyllic landscape. The heat of the day had driven him to seek solace in the cool embrace of the lake. As he waded into the refreshing water, the contrast between the searing heat and the lake's crisp chill was invigorating. The lake's calm appearance belied its hidden dangers. While Peter swam leisurely, enjoying the isolation and tranquility, he was unaware of the predator lurking beneath the surface. The formidable Nile crocodile had long made the lake its home. Its stealth and patience were legendary, perfectly adapted to its role as an apex predator in this watery realm. Peter's strokes were rhythmic and smooth, his body cutting through the water with ease. He ventured further from the shore, drawn by the allure of the lake's expansive openness. The surrounding dense and verdant vegetation created a natural amphitheater that seemed to frame the scene in a serene yet deceptive beauty. The only sounds were the gentle lapping of water against Peter's body and the occasional call of a distant bird. Beneath the tranquil surface, the crocodile's senses were acutely attuned to any disturbance. Its eyes barely breaking the water's surface tracked Peter's movements with calculated precision. The crocodile's powerful body lay in wait, every muscle coiled in readiness. Its ancient instincts told it that an opportunity was approaching, and it prepared to strike. Without warning, the lake's deceptive calm was shattered. The crocodile surged from below, a burst of raw power and aggression propelling it upward with terrifying speed. Peter's serene swimming was abruptly interrupted as the creature's massive jaws clamped down on his torso. The force was immense, the pressure excruciating, and the shock was immediate. Peter's initial reaction was one of disbelief and panic. His mind raced, trying to comprehend the violent transition from peace to terror. The crocodile's jaws were like a vice, and its strength was overwhelming. The creature's intention was clear, to drag its prey underwater and initiate a death roll, a brutal maneuver designed to disorient and drown. As Peter was pulled beneath the surface, the water closed in around him, the light above fading into murky darkness. The crocodile's powerful body coiled and twisted, its momentum creating a whirlpool that threatened to pull Peter further into the abyss. Every instinct Peter had honed through years of travel and adventure screamed at him to survive. The cold, oppressive water was a stark contrast to the lake's earlier serene facade. He fought desperately, his arms and legs flailing against the crushing force of the crocodile's jaws. The sensation of being trapped in a relentless vice was terrifying. But Peter's will to survive was stronger than the crocodile's grip. His fists struck out, making contact with the crocodile's rough, armored skin. Each punch was a desperate attempt to inflict pain, and forced the predator to relent. The crocodile, however, was relentless. Its grip was unyielding, and the spinning motion of the death roll only added to the disorientation. Peter's lungs burned for air, the need for oxygen becoming an ever-present, urgent demand. In a final act of sheer willpower, Peter used his feet to push against the crocodile's body. He managed to get a partial but crucial reprieve from the relentless spinning, his hands now searching frantically found the crocodile's eyes, vulnerable and sensitive. With fierce determination, Peter gouged at them, his fingers pressing into the soft, protective tissues. The crocodile's reaction was immediate and intuitive. The creature's jaws released their grip momentarily, a reflexive response to the intense pain inflicted on its eyes. The brief cessation of pressure was Peter's chance for survival. 
Gasping for air, he kicked and paddled furiously, propelling himself upward through the swirling water. His vision was still clouded, and the world above seemed distant and unreachable, but he fought through the disorientation with all the strength he had left. Breaking through the surface, Peter's breath came in ragged, desperate gasps. The lake's once peaceful expanse now seemed like an unforgiving expanse of survival. He could see the distant outline of a boat, its presence a beacon of hope amidst the chaos. The crocodile, though still in pursuit, had been momentarily disoriented by Peter's counterattack. Peter's instinct to move towards the boat was a lifeline, and he swam with all the power he could muster. Each stroke was a battle against the fatigue that threatened to overtake him. His body was battered, and the pain from the crocodile's attack was intense, but the sight of the boat kept him focused. The adrenaline surging through his veins provided a fleeting but vital strength. The ship seemed to inch closer with every stroke, its promise of safety a compelling goal. The crocodile, driven by its primal hunger, pursued relentlessly, its powerful tail propelling it through the water with formidable speed. But Peter's determination was unwavering. He reached the boat, his fingers grasping the edge as he pulled himself up with a final desperate effort. The ship, once a distant hope, was now his sanctuary. The crocodile, its prey now out of reach, submerged back into the depths, its hunger unsatisfied but its chance for a kill thwarted. Peter collapsed onto the boat, his body trembling with exhaustion and shock. The severity of his injuries was evident. The bite marks were deep, and the wounds were bleeding freely. His clothes were torn and his skin was a canvas of bruises and abrasions. The pain was overwhelming, but the relief of having escaped the immediate threat was profound. The boat, once a mere object of distant hope, now provided Peter with a semblance of safety. His breaths came in ragged gasps as he tried to steady himself, the reality of the encounter sinking in. The serene lake, which had seemed so inviting earlier, now held a dark memory of danger and near death. Peter's survival was a testament to his resilience and quick thinking. The encounter with the Nile crocodile had been a brutal reminder of nature's raw power and the thin line between tranquility and peril. As he lay on the boat, the lake's calm surface now seemed like a deceptive mask hiding its latent threats. Peter's experience would forever shape his perspective on the serene beauty of nature, reminding him that even the most peaceful settings could harbor hidden dangers. In November 1998, the small village of Asuom, nestled deep in the heart of Ghana, was enduring the peak of the dry season. The land was parched. The once lush greenery is now a faded memory. The sun beat down mercilessly each day, and the villagers sought relief wherever they could find it. For many, this meant visiting the local waterhole, a source of life and refreshment in an otherwise unforgiving landscape. The waterhole, located just outside the village, had always been a gathering place for the community. It was where children learned to swim, women washed clothes, and men cooled off after a long day's work. The water was shallow near the edges but grew deeper towards the center, where the older boys often dared each other to dive. Though the villagers knew the risks of swimming in natural bodies of water in Africa, they felt safe at this particular spot. The waterhole had been a haven for generations, and no one could recall a time when anything dangerous had happened there. Kofi Osei, a young man of 18, was among those who frequently visited the waterhole. Tall and strong, with a bright future ahead of him, Kofi was well-liked in the village. He was known for his kindness and his love of swimming. On this day, Kofi had finished his chores early and decided to head to the waterhole for a swim. The air was heavy with heat, and the thought of cool water was irresistible. As he walked towards the waterhole, he passed by friends and neighbors who greeted him warmly. It was a typical day in Asuom. Children played in the dusty streets, women gathered under the shade of trees, and men discussed the upcoming harvest season. There was a sense of peace and normalcy that belied the lurking danger. The waterhole itself was a picture of serenity. The surface of the water shimmered under the bright sun, reflecting the clear blue sky above. The trees surrounding the waterhole provided some shade, casting dappled shadows on the water. Birds chirped from the branches, and the occasional splash could be heard as fish broke the surface. To anyone watching, it seemed like a perfect day. But beneath the calm surface, 
Hidden in the murky depths, danger lay in wait. The dry season had forced many animals to seek out new water sources, and a large Nile crocodile had recently made the water hole its home. The villagers were unaware of the crocodile's presence, as it remained hidden in the deeper parts of the water hole, biding its time. Nile crocodiles are known for their patience and stealth, often lying in wait for hours, even days, before striking with lethal force. Kofi reached the water hole and quickly stripped down to his shorts. He dipped his toes into the water, relishing the coolness against his skin. With a smile, he waded in, feeling the tension of the day melt away. He swam out towards the center where the water was deepest, unaware of the predator that lurked below. The water was cool and inviting, and Kofi felt completely at ease. As he floated on his back looking up at the sky, Kofi couldn't have imagined the horror that was about to unfold. Without warning, the surface of the water erupted in a violent splash. The crocodile, having waited for the perfect moment, launched itself at Kofi with terrifying speed. Its powerful jaws clamped down on his midsection, the force of the bite knocking the air out of his lungs and sending shockwaves of pain through his body. The attack was so sudden and brutal that Kofi didn't even have time to scream before he was pulled under the water. The crocodile's teeth, sharp and strong, dug deep into Kofi's flesh, and the predator began to drag him toward the bottom of the waterhole. The water around them churned as Kofi struggled desperately, his instincts kicking in as he fought for his life. He kicked and punched at the crocodile, trying to free himself from its vice-like grip, but the animal was relentless. It had locked onto its prey, and there was no escape. As Kofi thrashed in the water, the crocodile performed its infamous death roll, twisting its massive body with incredible force. The roll was designed to disorient and subdue its prey, and it worked to devastating effect. Kofi's body was whipped around, and the force of the roll caused him to lose all sense of direction. The pain was overwhelming, and his lungs burned as he fought to hold his breath. The world around him became a blur of dark water and pain. On the shore, a group of villagers had heard the commotion and rushed to the waterhole. They watched in horror as the water turned red with blood, the surface churning as Kofi and the crocodile struggled beneath. Some of the men grabbed sticks and rocks, desperate to help, but they were too far away to intervene. The crocodile was too strong and too determined, and Kofi's chances of survival were slipping away with each passing second. The villagers shouted and waved their arms, hoping to scare the crocodile away. But the predator was focused solely on its prey. It continued to drag Kofi deeper into the water, the struggle becoming more frantic as the young man's strength began to fade. The water hole, once a place of peace and safety, had become a scene of unimaginable horror. As the crocodile pulled Kofi under for the final time, the water grew still. The villagers stood on the shore, their faces pale with shock and disbelief. The water, now stained with blood, lapped gently against the shore as if nothing had happened. The silence was deafening, broken only by the soft cries of the women who had come to see what had happened. Kofi was gone, taken by the predator that had made the water hole its hunting ground. The village of Asuom would never be the same. The incident served as a chilling reminder of the dangers that can lurk even in the most familiar and seemingly safe places. The waterhole, once a symbol of life and community, had become a place of fear and loss. In the days that followed, the villagers mourned the loss of Kofi, their hearts heavy with grief. They vowed to be more cautious and to never take the safety of their surroundings for granted again. The waterhole, once the center of village life, was now a place of sorrow a stark reminder of the brutal reality of life in the wild. The underwater environment was eerily still, broken only by the occasional exhale of air. Sarah was diving in a secluded spot off the coast of Hawaii, known for its intricate network of underwater caves and rich marine life. Her excitement was palpable as she glided through the clear water, surrounded by a vibrant blend of coral and aquatic flora. The cave system she explored was a labyrinth of narrow passages and vast chambers, its walls adorned with colorful anemones clinging to the rocks. Sarah moved cautiously, deliberately avoiding any disturbance to the delicate ecosystem. Her scuba gear provided a steady oxygen supply, and she monitored her air gauge closely, mindful of the need to return to the surface in time. Navigating a particularly narrow section, 
Sarah's flashlight beam caught the glint of something hidden among the rocks. Adjusting her position for a clearer view, she discovered a large moray eel coiled in the shadows. Its thick, segmented body and row of sharp, barely visible teeth made it an imposing presence. The eel's dark, watchful eyes seemed to track her every move. Despite her excitement, Sarah's heart raced with concern. Moray eels can be aggressive when threatened, and she knew the risks. Her breathing was steady as she tried to remain calm, aware that sudden movements might provoke the creature. The eel's tension grew as Sarah slowly attempted to back away, but the narrow passage restricted her movement. As she carefully maneuvered, the eel reacted. It darted forward with surprising speed, its sleek body a blur against the dark rock. Sarah's instincts surged as the eel's mouth opened wide, displaying its menacing teeth. It lunged, closing its powerful jaws around Sarah's leg with a jarring, searing pain. The bite was intense, the pressure of the eel's grip a stark contrast to the otherwise cool, enveloping water. Sarah's first reaction was to try to pull away, but the eel's grip was unyielding. She twisted her leg, trying to dislodge the eel, but it held fast. The pain intensified with each movement, and her vision blurred slightly as her body's stress response kicked in. Her mind raced through the emergency protocols she had learned. But at the moment, everything felt chaotic and disorienting. Desperation fueled her actions as she reached for her diving knife, strapped securely to her thigh. She fumbled with the knife, the small compartment of her diving suit making it challenging to maneuver. Finally, she managed to draw the knife and, with a trembling hand, brought it down toward the eel. The blade cut through the water with precision aimed directly at the eel's body. The first stab made contact, but the eel's grip didn't falter. Sarah felt a surge of frustration as the eel's powerful jaws continued to press against her leg. The wound was deep, and the pain radiated through her limb, mingling with the cold, numbing sensation of the surrounding water. Her breathing was ragged. Each inhale was a struggle as the limited air supply in her tank became a pressing concern. In a fierce effort, Sarah stabbed the eel repeatedly, each strike a desperate plea for release. The struggle between her and the eel grew more intense, the water around them becoming murky with the churned-up sediment. Her movements were frantic, driven by a primal urge to escape the clutches of the dangerous creature. Her mind was a whirlwind of thoughts about the dwindling air supply, the pain in her leg and the urgent need to find safety. The eel, feeling the increasing pressure and pain from Sarah's attacks, finally released its grip, its body writhing away. For a brief moment, Sarah was free, but the relief was fleeting. Her leg throbbed with an unbearable intensity. The bite wounds were a stark reminder of the encounter. Blood mingled with the water, creating a cloud around her as she tried to assess the damage and regain her composure. With the eel retreating into the cave's dark crevices, Sarah took advantage of the brief respite to swim toward the cave's exit. The narrow passage was still a challenge, but she focused on moving steadily, her mind racing with the urgency of the situation. Each stroke was a struggle against the increasing pain and the growing sense of exhaustion. The water seemed to press against her with a heavier weight as she swam, her leg throbbing with every movement. Her air gauge showed a critical level, the needle inching toward empty. Panic crept into her thoughts, but she fought to keep it at bay, concentrating on the need to reach the surface before her oxygen ran out. As she emerged from the cave and into the open water, the pressure of the situation began to lift, though the pain in her leg was still intense. The surface seemed almost blindingly bright compared to the dim light of the cave, and Sarah oriented herself toward the boat anchored nearby. Each stroke toward the boat felt like an eternity, her energy waning with every movement. The boat loomed closer, a beacon of safety amidst the vast expanse of ocean. Sarah could see the faint figures of her fellow divers on board, their attention focused on their tasks. With a final burst of strength, she reached the boat, her arms weakly grasping the ladder. The pain in her leg was a relentless reminder of the ordeal, but the sight of the vessel and the reassurance of its presence brought a measure of relief. The climb up the ladder was arduous, her leg throbbing with every step. Her fellow divers quickly noticed her distress, their faces a mix of concern and surprise as they helped her aboard. The captain called for emergency assistance and Sarah was carefully laid down on the deck, her leg elevated to minimize further bleeding. 
The boat's crew worked swiftly, providing first aid and preparing for the arrival of medical professionals. Sarah's mind was a blur of pain and exhaustion, but the knowledge that she was safe and receiving help provided some comfort. The ordeal had left her physically and emotionally drained, but it also offered a stark reminder of the unpredictable nature of underwater exploration. As the boat made its way back to shore, Sarah's thoughts drifted to the experience she had just endured. The encounter with the Moray Eel had been a harrowing reminder of the dangers that lurk beneath the surface, even in the most beautiful and serene environments. The vivid memory of the eel's bite, the pain, and the struggle for survival would remain with her as a testament to the fragility and unpredictability of life beneath the waves. The leg injury was severe, and the healing process would be long and challenging. Yet the experience had also deepened her respect for the ocean and its inhabitants. Sarah's encounter with the Moray eel was a stark reminder of the balance between exploration and caution, a lesson learned most intensely and unforgettably. April 2003, Jake Thornton, a seasoned adventurer and outdoor enthusiast, set out on a solo kayaking trip along the rugged coastline of New Zealand's South Island. Jake had always been drawn to the sea, and the stretch of ocean near Kaikoura was one of his favorite places to paddle. The region was known for its stunning scenery, with towering cliffs, rocky outcrops, and the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean stretching out to the horizon. On that particular day, the weather was perfect. The sky was clear, the sea was calm, and there was a slight breeze that made the conditions ideal for kayaking. Jake was an experienced kayaker, having spent years exploring various waterways across New Zealand and beyond. He was well prepared for the journey, equipped with all the necessary gear and a keen sense of adventure. That morning, he had launched his kayak from a small, secluded beach, eager to spend the day navigating the coastline, exploring hidden coves, and maybe even spotting some of the region's abundant marine life. The area was known for its dolphins, seals, and occasionally larger predators like orcas and sharks. But Jake wasn't concerned. He had been in these waters many times before and knew how to handle himself. As he paddled further out to sea, the tranquility of the open ocean enveloped him. The rhythmic sound of the paddle dipping into the water and the gentle swaying of the kayak was almost meditative. Jake relished the solitude, the feeling of being completely alone in such a vast and beautiful environment. He watched seabirds glide overhead and saw the occasional seal popping its head above the water, curious about the lone kayaker passing by. It was the kind of day that made all the effort of getting out of bed early worthwhile. Jake decided to paddle toward a small island a few miles off the coast. The island, a rocky outcrop surrounded by deep blue water, was one of his favorite spots. The journey there would take a couple of hours, but Jake was in no hurry. He savored the journey, enjoying the sense of freedom that came with being out on the water, far from the noise and stress of everyday life. As he approached the island, the water became slightly choppier, but it was nothing Jake couldn't handle. He had navigated through much rougher conditions before. The sun was high in the sky, and Jake considered taking a break on the island, maybe eating the lunch he had packed and enjoying the view before heading back to the mainland. But as he continued paddling, something in the water caught his eye. A dark shape moved beneath the surface, large and fast. Jake's heart skipped a beat, but he remained calm, knowing that many large fish and sea mammals lived in these waters. But then the shape moved closer, and Jake realized it was not just any sea creature. It was a bull shark, one of the most aggressive and unpredictable sharks in the ocean. Before Jake could fully comprehend the situation, the shark rammed into the side of his kayak with incredible force. The impact was so sudden and powerful that it knocked Jake into the water, flipping the kayak over and leaving him struggling to stay afloat. The cold water shocked his system, but there was no time to think. The shark was circling him, its dorsal fin cutting through the water like a knife, coming closer with each pass. Panic set in as Jake frantically tried to right his kayak, but the shark wasn't giving him a chance. It was clearly agitated, its behavior aggressive as it prepared to strike again. Jake grabbed onto the side of the kayak, trying to pull himself back on. But the shark came at him, its jaws snapping shut around his leg with terrifying force. The pain was immediate and excruciating. The shark's teeth dug deep into his flesh, and Jake could feel the power of the predator as it tried to pull him under. 
Blood poured from the wound, turning the water around him red. Jake fought back with everything he had, using his paddle to strike at the shark, desperate to free himself from its grip. He knew that if he went under, it would be over. The shark released his leg, but it wasn't done. It circled back, ramming the kayak again, trying to knock Jake off balance. The kayak was now listing dangerously, water filling the cockpit as the shark continued its assault. Jake managed to get one leg back into the kayak, but the shark struck again, its body slamming into the kayak with such force that it nearly capsized. The situation was dire, and Jake knew he had to stay calm if he wanted to survive. With sheer willpower, Jake continued to fend off the shark, using his paddle as a weapon to keep it at bay. Each time the shark came close, he struck out, hoping to deter it long enough to escape. His leg was throbbing with pain, the blood loss making him feel lightheaded, but he couldn't give up. He had to keep fighting. Then, in the distance, Jake saw a boat, a small fishing vessel heading in his direction. He waved his arms frantically, shouting for help, even as the shark made another pass. The boat's occupants saw the commotion and quickly changed course, speeding toward Jake. The sight of the boat gave him a surge of hope, but the shark wasn't done yet. As the boat approached, the shark made one final attempt to take Jake down, lunging at the kayak and grabbing hold of it with its powerful jaws. The kayak shook violently, and Jake nearly lost his grip, but he held on, striking the shark repeatedly until it finally let go. The boat arrived just in time, the crew pulling Jake aboard as the shark swam off, disappearing into the deep. Jake collapsed on the deck, his body shaking with pain and exhaustion. His leg was badly injured, and the blood loss had left him weak, but he was alive. The crew quickly tended to his wounds, applying pressure to stop the bleeding as they headed back to shore. The attack left Jake with severe injuries and a deep respect for the power of the ocean. The bull shark, one of the most feared predators in the sea, had nearly claimed another victim. As Jake lay on the deck staring up at the clear blue sky, he knew that he had come close to losing everything, but he had survived and that was something to be grateful for. The morning sun filtered through the Great Barrier Reef as Lucas descended into the water, casting a kaleidoscope of light that danced across the vibrant corals. As Lucas floated effortlessly, the world above seemed a distant memory, and he was wholly immersed in this breathtaking underwater realm. Lucas had studied the reef's ecosystem for years, and now, experiencing it firsthand was exhilarating. Time slipped away as he ventured deeper into this mesmerizing world. An experienced snorkeler, Lucas was accustomed to the occasional curious fish and the rare sight of larger creatures. He knew to respect marine life and its delicate balance. However, the reef, despite its apparent peace, held its dangers. Navigating a narrow passage between two large coral formations, Lucas noticed a subtle shift in the water. A small reef shark, about six feet long, appeared, its sleek body cutting through the water with purpose. While the shark's presence was fascinating, it also signaled an imminent threat. The shark, likely a juvenile but still formidable, began to exhibit deliberate, tense movements as it approached Lucas. Lucas, absorbed in the moment, moved closer to get a better view, inadvertently encroaching on the shark's territory. The shark's behavior shifted, its body tensed, and its movements became sharper. As Lucas hovered near the shark, it turned its head, its eyes narrowing in assessment. In an instant, the shark closed the distance and before Lucas could react, its jaws clamped down on his arm. The initial pain was searing, a shock that radiated through his entire body. He looked down in horror at the shark's teeth embedded in his flesh, blood mingling with the surrounding water. Panicked, Lucas thrashed wildly, trying to dislodge the shark. His frantic movements only tightened the shark's grip, intensifying the pain. The vibrant colors of the reef were overshadowed by the red cloud of blood trailing behind him. Struggling to push the shark away, Lucas found the water thick and resistant, each movement slow and difficult. His heart raced, and his breathing grew erratic as the once beautiful reef turned into a dangerous trap. The shark's grip remained unyielding, its sharp and relentless teeth cut deeper with every movement. Lucas's arm felt as if it were on fire the searing pain blending with a profound sense of dread. The blood that stained the water could attract other predators, and the thought of a more dangerous encounter added to his terror. He knew he had to escape, but the struggle to free himself from the shark's jaws was an arduous battle. 
With every ounce of strength left, Lucas fought against the shark's tenacity. He twisted and turned, trying to dislodge the creature from his arm. The struggle seemed eternal, each second stretching into what felt like hours. The coral formations around him became a chaotic blur as he desperately tried to orient himself. Finally, with a surge of adrenaline, Lucas managed to break free from the shark's grip. The shark, having realized that its attack had failed to subdue its prey, retreated with a swift flick of its tail. It darted away into the depths, leaving Lucas alone in the water, his arm a throbbing, bloody mess. The immediate danger had passed, but Lucas's situation was far from safe. He looked around, his vision clouded by the blood in the water. The reef, which had seemed so inviting moments before, now felt hostile and treacherous. With a grim sense of urgency, Lucas began to make his way towards the surface. His movements were slow and difficult, each stroke of his flipper a painful reminder of his injury. The journey back to the surface was agonizing. Every movement caused waves of pain to shoot through his arm. He could feel the warm blood trickling from his wound, adding a grim sense of urgency to his struggle. The thought of other predators attracted by his blood pushed him to move faster despite the searing pain. Lucas's breath came in ragged gasps as he neared the surface. The sun's rays, once a source of comfort, now seemed distant and unreachable. The water around him grew lighter and the boat that had brought him to this location came into view. Its presence was a beacon of hope, a sign of safety amidst the chaos. As Lucas finally reached the boat, he clung to the side with his uninjured arm, his body trembling from the exertion and pain. The crew, seeing his distressed state, quickly pulled him aboard. The relief of being out of the water was immense, but the reality of his injury was a sobering sight. His arm was a mess of blood and torn flesh, a grim reminder of the encounter. The crew acted swiftly, administering first aid and preparing to get Lucas to medical attention. The pain was unbearable, but the knowledge that he was out of immediate danger provided some comfort. The wound was treated and the boat began its return journey. The vibrant reef that had once been a source of wonder is now a backdrop to Lucas's harrowing experience. As the boat made its way back to shore, Lucas reflected on the events of the day. The reef, with all its beauty, had revealed a darker side, a reminder of the unpredictable nature of the ocean. His encounter with the reef shark had been a stark lesson in the delicate balance between curiosity and caution. The pain and fear he had experienced were a testament to the raw power of nature and the respect it demanded. Lucas's injury required further treatment, and he would carry the physical and emotional scars of the encounter for years to come. The experience left him with a profound respect for the ocean and its inhabitants. The Great Barrier Reef, with all its beauty, had shown him that the allure of the underwater world was matched by its inherent dangers. It was a harsh but invaluable lesson, one that would forever shape his relationship with the ocean. January 1999, the summer heat was at its peak in Australia, and the coastal town of Port Carlisle was buzzing with activity. Tourists and locals alike flocked to the beach, eager to escape the sweltering temperatures. The beaches along this stretch of the coast were known for their clear waters and white sands, making them a favorite spot for families and young people. Among the crowds that day was 14-year-old Josh Carter, a towering boy for his age already weighing over 200 pounds due to his large frame and athletic build. Josh was a natural athlete playing rugby at his school, and his size and strength made him a force to be reckoned with on the field. Josh was on vacation with his parents and a group of friends from school. They had spent the morning playing beach volleyball, eating snacks, and enjoying the sun. By early afternoon, the heat had become almost unbearable, and the group decided to cool off with a swim in the ocean. The beach was well patrolled, and though shark sightings were not unheard of in these waters, the area was generally considered safe for swimmers. Lifeguards kept a close watch, and the water was filled with families and children, all enjoying the cool relief from the summer sun. Josh and his friends splashed into the water, laughing and challenging each other to swim out to the deeper waves. The ocean was calm, the waves gently lapping against their bodies as they swam further from the shore. The sounds of seagulls filled the air, and the smell of salt water and sunscreen was strong. It was the perfect day, the kind of day that makes you forget about the dangers that can lie hidden beneath the surface. The boys swam out beyond the crowded shallows, 
where the water was deeper and the waves more challenging. Josh, always eager to prove himself, led the way, his strong strokes propelling him further out than the others. The water here was cooler, and the depth made it harder to see the bottom. But Josh wasn't concerned. He was confident in his swimming abilities and felt at home in the water. However, Josh and his friends didn't know that on this day a massive great white shark was patrolling the waters nearby. The shark, nearly 18 feet long, had been drawn closer to shore by the presence of seals and schools of fish, its natural prey. Great white sharks are apex predators, and their size and power make them one of the most feared creatures in the ocean. Though they rarely target humans, mistaking them for seals can lead to tragic encounters. As Josh swam further from the shore, his friends began to call out to him, urging him to turn back. But he was focused on the waves ahead, his mind on the thrill of the swim. The water around him was calm, the surface unbroken by any signs of danger. Yet beneath him, the great white shark had taken notice of the large figure moving through the water. In a flash, the shark moved. The calm water was shattered as the massive predator surged upwards its powerful tail propelling it at terrifying speed. Josh barely had time to register the movement beneath him before the great white struck with a force that sent shockwaves through the water. The shark's jaws clamped down on Josh's side, the sheer power of the bite nearly cutting him in half. The impact was so sudden and violent that it knocked the breath from his lungs, and he was pulled under the water before he could even scream. The water, once clear and blue, turned crimson as blood poured from the wound. The shark's teeth, sharp as knives, tore through flesh and bone with ease, its powerful body thrashing as it tried to subdue its prey. Josh's friends, still swimming closer to shore, turned at the sound of the water's violent disturbance. Their eyes widened in horror as they saw the massive dorsal fin breaking the surface, the water around it stained with blood. Panic set in and they began to shout for help, their voices filled with terror. On the beach, people began to notice the commotion. Lifeguards sprang into action, blowing their whistles and waving people out of the water. But it was already too late. The great white shark, driven by its predatory instincts, had pulled Josh deeper into the ocean. The boy's struggles were no match for the shark's strength, and with each thrash of its powerful tail it dragged him further from safety. Josh's body was limp, the pain overwhelming as he tried to fight back. But the shark was relentless, its jaws crushing down with every bite. The water around them was a chaotic mix of blood and foam, the once peaceful ocean now a scene of unimaginable horror. The beach, so full of life just moments before, had fallen into stunned silence as onlookers watched the tragedy unfold. Despite the lifeguard's desperate attempts to reach him, the shark's assault was too much. It took Josh down once more, disappearing into the depths with its prey. The water slowly began to calm, the waves washing away the blood leaving behind only the broken remains of a surfboard and the haunting memory of what had just occurred. The beach, once filled with laughter and joy, was now overshadowed by the brutal reality of nature's power. The attack left the community in shock, a stark reminder of the dangers that lurk beneath the ocean's surface. Patrols were increased, and shark warnings became a common sight. But the memory of that day would linger long after the summer ended. The boat bobbed gently on the calm waters of the Gulf of Mexico, its white hull contrasting sharply with the deep blue of the sea. The sun hung high, casting a golden glow that danced across the surface. Carla, standing at the helm, glanced at her dog, a small brown terrier named Max, who was barking incessantly at the edge of the boat. The noise was grating and Carla's patience was wearing thin. Max had been a constant companion, loyal and affectionate, but today, the incessant barking was too much. Carla had tried everything to calm him down. Treats, toys, gentle reprimands, but nothing worked. The dog's agitation seemed to heighten her frustration, creating a vicious cycle of irritation. With every yelp and whine, her resolve hardened. In a moment of reckless anger, Carla's patience snapped. Her face flushed with a mixture of rage and regret. She made a decision she would come to regret deeply. Without considering the full implications of her actions, Carla scooped up Max and in a motion driven by frustration rather than logic, hurled him overboard. The splash that followed was immediate and loud, breaking the serene surface of the water. 
The instant Max hit the water, the sea's tranquility turned into a scene of impending dread. The splash attracted the attention of a group of sharks that had been circling the boat, their fins slicing through the water with predatory grace. Carla's heart lurched as she saw the fins moving closer, their menacing shapes cutting a path toward the splashing water where Max had landed. Horror washed over Carla as she watched the sharks close in on her small dog. The realization of her reckless decision hit her like a cold wave. Panic surged through her veins. Without thinking, she threw aside her fears and leaped into the water, her body hitting the sea with a jarring splash. Her mind was a frenzy of guilt and fear as she swam towards Max, who was paddling frantically, his small legs working hard to stay afloat. Sensing the disturbance, the sharks increased their pace. Their presence was a haunting reminder of the danger lurking beneath the surface. Carla's strokes were powerful but panicked, her breaths coming in ragged gasps as she approached Max. The water around her was frothy with churned-up waves and her frantic movements. Max's eyes were wide with terror as he struggled to stay afloat. Carla reached him just as the first shark's massive jaws snapped near him, the sharp teeth glinting ominously. Her heart raced, the proximity of the predator heightening her desperation. With every ounce of strength, Carla pushed Max ahead of her, guiding him toward the boat. Her kicks were erratic but forceful as she tried to fend off the sharks. She used her hands and feet to splash and create a barrier between the predators and her precious dog. Attracted by the commotion, the sharks were relentless. They circled with increasing aggression, their sleek bodies cutting through the water with unsettling precision. Carla's fear was palpable. She could feel their presence all too closely. Every moment felt like an eternity as she fought both the water and the predators. Her kicks were becoming less effective, her energy waning under the strain. The boat loomed ahead, its safety seeming both near and impossibly distant. Carla's friend Derek was on the deck, his eyes wide with horror as he saw the unfolding chaos. With adrenaline fueling her final burst of energy, Carla pushed Max towards the boat, her hands trembling as she signaled Derek for help. Derek, seizing the urgency of the moment, grabbed a rope and leaned over the edge of the boat, his movements swift and determined. Carla's struggle reached a peak of desperation. A shark's jaws snapped just inches from her leg, the rush of water from its bite sending a shiver down her spine. The proximity of the predator was a stark reminder of how close she was to disaster. With a final, Herculean effort, Carla managed to push Max up towards Derek. Her friend reached down grabbed the small dog and hauled him to safety with a swift pull. The relief on Derek's face was immediate, but Carla's ordeal was far from over. As Max was pulled aboard, Carla was left in the water exhausted and gasping. Her limbs felt leaden, her strength nearly spent. The sharks were still circling, their dark forms creating a barrier between her and safety. With every ounce of her remaining strength, Carla struggled to make her way towards the boat. Her movements were slow her body feeling the weight of the fear and fatigue that had taken hold of her. Derek, realizing Carla was still in danger, acted quickly. He threw down a rope and extended a hand, his face etched with a mix of urgency and concern. Carla grabbed the rope, her fingers slipping as she fought against the fatigue and the pull of the water. Derek pulled her with determined effort, the rope digging into her hands as she climbed. The final moments were a blur of effort and relief as Carla was hauled back onto the deck. Collapsing onto the boat, Carla lay there, her breath coming in ragged gasps. The reality of what had transpired settled heavily upon her. Max, now safe and shaken, was being comforted by Derek, his small body trembling. Carla's hands and legs were scraped and bruised, her heart still racing from the adrenaline and fear. The near disaster had left her physically and emotionally drained. As Carla sat on the deck, wrapped in a blanket, her gaze fixed on the horizon. The total weight of her recklessness and the danger she had narrowly avoided was clear. The close call had been a brutal reminder of the unpredictable and often dangerous nature of the sea. The ordeal had shaken her to her core, leaving her with a deep sense of gratitude for the safety of her dog and herself, and a reminder of how a moment of anger could lead to unforeseen and life-threatening consequences. On a warm evening in August 2012 at the popular surf spot of Laguna Point in Southern California, a group of friends decided to make the most of the fading daylight. Laguna Point was known for its excellent waves and stunning sunsets, drawing surfers from all over the state. 
The group, consisting of Alex Rivera, Nate Wilson, Hannah Clark, and Jordan Mitchell, had spent the day riding the waves and enjoying the beach. They were seasoned surfers, comfortable with the ocean's ebb and flow, but this day would challenge their skills and bravery in unexpected ways. As the sun dipped lower, casting a golden glow over the water, the friends paddled out for one last session. The air was filled with the sounds of seagulls and the gentle roar of the surf. It had been a perfect day so far, filled with laughter and the thrill of catching wave after wave. The group was eager to take advantage of the diminishing light to capture the last moments of daylight on their boards. Great white sharks were known to inhabit the waters of Southern California. These powerful predators could grow up to 20 feet long and were apex predators in the ocean. While shark attacks were rare, dusk and dawn were known to be prime hunting times for these creatures, as their prey was more active and visibility was lower. As the light continued to fade, the surfers noticed the water becoming darker, shadows lengthening beneath them. The mood was still light, filled with the camaraderie of friends who had shared countless waves. Alex, the most experienced of the group, was the first to notice a change in the water's behavior. The waves seemed less predictable and the water was more agitated. He mentioned it to the others, but they brushed it off, eager to catch the last waves of the day. Suddenly, without warning, a large dark shape appeared beneath the surface, moving with terrifying speed. The great white shark in search of prey had mistaken the surfers for seals, its usual meal. The shark struck with incredible force, targeting Nate, who was closest to its path. In an instant, the tranquility of the evening was shattered. The shark's powerful jaws clamped down on Nate's leg, pulling him off his board and into the water. His screams of pain and terror cut through the air, sending a jolt of fear through his friends. The water around Nate turned red as the shark's teeth tore into his flesh. Panic erupted among the group as they realized the gravity of the situation. Alex, Hannah, and Jordan watched in horror, their minds racing to find a way to save their friend. Alex, drawing on his experience and quick thinking, paddled towards Nate, yelling at Hannah and Jordan to head back to shore and get help. The shark, momentarily distracted by its initial attack, circled back for another strike. Alex reached Nate, grabbed him, and tried to pull him onto his board. The shark's massive body loomed beneath them, its dorsal fin cutting through the water with deadly precision. The great white shark was relentless, its instinct to hunt overpowering any hesitation. As Alex struggled to lift Nate onto his board, the shark surged upwards, its jaws snapping at them. Alex used his board as a shield, trying to fend off the predator while holding onto Nate. The water was a chaos of thrashing limbs and the churn of the shark's powerful tail. Nate's leg was severely injured, with blood flowing freely into the water, further agitating the shark. The pain was excruciating, but he clung to Alex, trusting his friend to get him to safety. Alex's mind raced as he tried to think of a way to escape. The shore seemed impossibly far, and the shark was too close, too aggressive. Meanwhile, Hannah and Jordan had reached the shore, frantically waving for help. Their cries alerted other beachgoers and surfers, who quickly realized the dire situation unfolding in the water. Someone called 911, and within minutes, local authorities and lifeguards were mobilizing to assist. The urgency was palpable. Everyone's eyes were fixed on the two figures battling the shark in the distance. Back in the water, the shark made another pass, its eyes cold and focused. Alex knew they couldn't outswim it. Their only chance was to make it seem like too much of a challenge to pursue. With every ounce of strength he had left, Alex struck the shark's snout with his fist, a desperate attempt to deter it. The shark recoiled slightly, momentarily disoriented. Seizing the moment, Alex paddled furiously, pulling Nate along with him. The effort was grueling, but the adrenaline and fear drove him forward. The shark, regaining its bearings, began to circle again, its dorsal fin slicing through the water menacingly. It was a race against time, and Alex could feel his energy waning. Just as the shark closed in for another attack, a rescue boat appeared, speeding toward them. Lifeguards on the boat threw a rope and flotation device to Alex, who grabbed it with relief. They hauled Nate aboard first, his leg a mangled mess of flesh and blood. Alex was pulled in next, collapsing onto the deck, his body trembling from the exertion and fear. The lifeguards immediately tended to Nate's injuries, applying pressure to the wound to slow the bleeding. 
The boat sped back to shore where paramedics were waiting to take Nate to the hospital. Alex lay on the deck, his chest heaving, grateful that they had made it out alive. On shore, the beach was a flurry of activity. Authorities cordoned off the area, and shark experts arrived to assess the situation. The attack had been sudden and brutal, a stark reminder of the ocean's dangers. As the sun finally dipped below the horizon, casting the beach in shadow, a sense of calm began to return. The friends gathered, shaken but relieved that they were all alive. In the days that followed, local authorities and shark experts worked to understand why the shark had ventured so close to the surf zone. They increased patrols and issued warnings about the dangers of dusk and dawn surfing, hoping to prevent future incidents. The attack left a lasting impact on the community, a sobering reminder of the unpredictable power of the sea. In the deep waters of the Atlantic Ocean, just off the coast of Nova Scotia, John Mercer was living out his routine day of commercial fishing. It was a crisp morning on June 8, 2011. John had been a fisherman all his life, following in the footsteps of his father and grandfather. The sea was his second home, and he knew its moods and mysteries well. He and his crew had set out early from the small harbor town of Southport, a place known for its robust fishing industry and hardy seafaring folk. John's boat, the Sea Voyager, was a sturdy vessel well-equipped for the challenges of deep-sea fishing. On this particular day, the sea was calm, the sky clear, and the promise of a good catch was in the air. John's crew, consisting of his longtime friends Ray Miller and Tom Green, were in high spirits, bantering and working efficiently as they prepared the lines and nets for the day's fishing. The target of their expedition was the swordfish, a prized catch in these waters. Swordfish were known for their long, sharp bills and powerful bodies. They could grow up to 15 feet in length and weigh over 1,000 pounds. These fish were fast and aggressive, often putting up a fierce fight when hooked. John had encountered swordfish before, but each encounter was unique, demanding skill, strength, and a bit of luck. As the morning turned into afternoon, the sea voyager moved further into the deep waters. John kept a watchful eye on the sonar looking for signs of the big fish. The sun was high in the sky, casting a shimmering path on the blue expanse of the ocean. The crew had already caught a good haul of smaller fish and the mood on the boat was buoyant. Around mid-afternoon, the sonar pinged with a large, fast-moving object. John's heart quickened. This could be the swordfish they were after. He signaled to his crew and they sprang into action, preparing the heavy-duty fishing gear designed for such a formidable opponent. The anticipation was palpable as they waited for the fish to take the bait. Suddenly there was a violent tug on the line. John knew immediately that they had hooked something big. The rod bent under the immense pressure and the line whizzed out rapidly. John braced himself, gripping the rod firmly as the boat rocked from the force of the struggle. The fight was on, and it was clear that this swordfish was not going to be an easy catch. The swordfish thrashed wildly, its strength and determination evident in every pull and twist. John's muscles strained as he battled to keep control of the rod. The fish surged, diving deep and then bursting upwards, its sharp bill cutting through the water with deadly precision. Each movement sent shockwaves through the line, testing the limits of John's endurance and skill. Ray and Tom watched with bated breath, ready to assist but knowing that this was John's fight. The swordfish was relentless, and John had to use every ounce of his experience to anticipate its moves and counter them. The boat pitched and rolled, the sound of the line cutting through the water echoing in the tense silence. The swordfish made a sudden, powerful lunge towards the boat. Its bill struck the hull with a resounding thud, sending a shiver through the vessel. John's grip slipped momentarily, but he quickly regained control, tightening his hold on the rod. The fish circled the boat, its dorsal fins slicing through the water menacingly. John could feel the burn in his arms and back, the physical toll of the struggle becoming more intense. Sweat dripped down his face and he gritted his teeth, refusing to let the fish win. He knew that one wrong move could result in serious damage to the boat or injury to himself or his crew. The stakes were high and the swordfish seemed to know it, fighting with a ferocity that matched John's resolve. The fish made another charge at the boat, this time coming dangerously close to the deck. Its sharp bill slashed through the air and John had to duck to avoid being hit. The crew scrambled, trying to keep the lines clear and the boat steady. The swordfish was now right alongside the boat, 
its massive body churning the water into a frothy swirl. With a final desperate effort, John pulled with all his might. The swordfish resisted, but gradually the powerful fish began to tire. Its thrashes became less violent, and its movements more sluggish. John seized the moment using his experience to guide the fish closer to the boat. Ray and Tom moved in, ready with gaffs to secure the catch. The swordfish gave one last weak thrash as it was brought alongside the boat. John's muscles screamed in protest, but he held on, refusing to let go. Ray and Tom managed to secure the fish, hauling it aboard with a triumphant yell. The massive swordfish lay on the deck, its body still quivering with the remnants of its fierce struggle. John collapsed onto a crate, his body shaking with exhaustion and relief. The swordfish was a magnificent specimen, a testament to the raw power of the ocean. The crew cheered, their spirits lifted by the hard-won victory. They had faced the might of the sea and emerged victorious, a reminder of the perilous nature of their work and the respect it demanded. In the turquoise waters of the Caribbean, the annual Antigua Sailing Week regatta was in full swing. It was May 10, 2010, and the sun was high in the sky, casting a brilliant glow over the sea. The regatta was a prestigious event, attracting skilled sailors from around the world. The race course was set around the island of Antigua, known for its stunning beaches and perfect sailing conditions. One of the competing boats, the Sea Falcon, was crewed by a close-knit group of friends. Ben Turner, Maria Lewis, Chris Douglas, and Lily Harper. They had been sailing together for years, and their teamwork had been honed through countless races and adventures. The mood on the Sea Falcon was one of excitement and determination as they navigated the course, aiming for a top finish. The morning had been perfect for sailing. The wind was steady, and the sea was calm. Ben, the captain, stood at the helm, guiding the boat with a practiced hand. Maria and Chris worked the sails with precision, while Lily kept a sharp lookout for other competitors. They had a good start and were making excellent time, with the boat cutting smoothly through the water. Mako sharks, known for their speed and agility, inhabited these waters. These powerful predators could grow up to 12 feet long and were known for their sudden, aggressive behavior. While encounters with boats were rare, the potential for danger always existed, adding an element of unpredictability to the race. As the Sea Falcon rounded a buoy and headed for the next leg of the race, the crew noticed a slight disturbance in the water behind them. At first, they thought it was just the wake of the boat, but the disturbance grew more pronounced. Lily, from her vantage point, squinted at the water, trying to make out the source. Suddenly, a sleek, dark shape emerged, moving with alarming speed. It was a large mako shark drawn by the boat's wake. The shark began to circle the Sea Falcon, its movements fluid and deliberate. The crew's initial curiosity quickly turned to concern as the shark's behavior became more aggressive. It started ramming the hull, each impact sending shutters through the boat. Ben called for everyone's attention, the gravity of the situation sinking in. They had to think quickly. The shark's strikes were powerful, causing significant damage to the hull. Water began to seep in, and the once calm and controlled environment of the boat turned chaotic. The crew scrambled to assess the damage and come up with a plan. Abandoning a ship in open water with a predator circling was a terrifying thought, but staying on board a sinking vessel was equally dire. Ben tried to steer the boat away, hoping to outmaneuver the shark. But the creature was relentless, its predatory instincts fully engaged. The tension on the Sea Falcon was palpable. Each crew member focused on their task, trying to keep the boat afloat and avoid further provocation from the shark. They needed to send a distress call to the other competitors and rescue teams, but communication in the chaos proved challenging. Maria grabbed the radio, her hands shaking as she tried to get a signal out. The minutes felt like hours as the shark continued its assault, the boat groaning with each hit. The Sea Falcon situation grew increasingly dire as the Mako shark's relentless attacks continued. The hull was taking on more water, and the crew's options were dwindling. Ben's mind raced as he tried to balance steering the boat and keeping his crew safe. The shark showed no signs of leaving. Its aggressive behavior turned their race into a nightmare. Maria finally managed to get a distress call out, her voice steady despite the fear gripping her. She relayed their coordinates and the nature of their emergency, hoping that nearby boats or rescue teams would hear them and respond quickly. The radio crackled with acknowledgments, 
giving the crew a sliver of hope amid the chaos. Chris and Lily worked frantically to patch the hull, using whatever materials they could find. Their hands moved quickly, their faces set with determination. Every impact from the shark felt like a countdown, each second precious. Ben steered the boat in erratic patterns, trying to confuse the sharks and buy them more time. The shark made a particularly vicious strike, nearly throwing Ben off balance. The crew held their breath as the boat lurched, the shark's fin slicing through the water with deadly precision. Ben regained control, but the strain was evident on his face. He knew they couldn't keep this up much longer. Suddenly, a response came over the radio. A nearby competitor, the Windrider, had heard their distress call and was heading their way. The news brought a surge of relief, but they knew they still had to hold on until help arrived. The Windrider's captain, aware of the danger, coordinated with the Sea Falcon, planning a rescue operation on the move. The Windrider approached at full speed, its crew ready for action. The sight of the approaching boat gave the Sea Falcon's crew a renewed sense of hope. Ben communicated with the Windrider's captain, laying out a plan to transfer his crew safely. It was a risky maneuver, but they had no other choice. As the Windrider drew alongside the Sea Falcon, the shark's behavior grew even more aggressive. It rammed the boat with such force that water sprayed into the air. Ben knew they had to act fast. He gave the signal and Chris and Lily moved towards the edge, ready to jump to the safety of the Windrider. The transfer was fraught with tension. Chris made it across first, leaping onto the Windrider's deck with agility. Lily followed, her heart pounding as she jumped, landing safely with the help of the Windrider's crew. Maria was next, her nerves on edge but her movements sure. Finally, it was Ben's turn. He took one last look at the Sea Falcon, then jumped, landing hard on the Windrider's deck. With the crew safely aboard, the Windrider sped away, putting distance between them and the enraged shark. The Sea Falcon, now abandoned, continued to take on water, the shark still circling it. The crew watched in silence, their hearts heavy with the loss of their boat, but grateful for their safety. The mangroves of Florida's Cedar Key, a small coastal town, were teeming with life on a warm day in June 2007. Cedar Key was known for its serene waters and rich marine biodiversity. The mangrove channels were a favorite spot for kayakers, offering a peaceful retreat and a chance to observe the diverse wildlife. The area was particularly known for its population of bull sharks, formidable predators that often ventured into shallow waters. Jess Morton, a seasoned adventurer with a love for kayaking, had decided to spend her day exploring these tranquil waters. Jess had been to Cedar Key many times before, drawn by the beauty of the mangroves and the thrill of encountering wildlife. She had set out early that morning, her kayak gliding smoothly through the calm water as she paddled deeper into the mangrove maze. Jess was well aware of the presence of bull sharks in these waters. Bull sharks were known for their aggressive and territorial nature. Unlike other sharks, they could thrive in both salt and fresh water, making them frequent visitors to coastal areas and river mouths. They were powerful predators, capable of sudden bursts of speed and displaying unpredictable behavior. Despite this knowledge, Jess felt confident in her abilities and was prepared to handle any situation that might arise. The morning had been perfect so far. The sun cast a warm glow over the water and the mangroves provided a canopy of shade. Jess enjoyed the peacefulness of the surroundings, the rhythmic sound of her paddle slicing through the water, and the occasional splash of fish darting beneath her kayak. She had seen a variety of birds, crabs, and even a few dolphins in the distance. As the sun climbed higher in the sky, Jess decided to explore a particularly narrow channel, hoping to spot more wildlife. She paddled slowly, her eyes scanning the water and the dense mangrove roots. The air was thick with the sounds of nature, the rustling of leaves, the calls of birds, and the distant hum of insects. It was a perfect day for an adventure, and Jess felt completely at ease. Suddenly, a large splash disrupted the tranquility. Jess paused, her paddle suspended in midair as she scanned the water. A dark shape moved beneath the surface, circling her kayak. Her heart skipped a beat as she realized it was a bull shark, drawn by the splashing of her paddle. The shark bumped the kayak aggressively, causing it to rock back and forth. Jess's calm paddle turned into a tense standoff. The shark circled her kayak, its dorsal fin cutting through the water with an air of menace. 
Jess gripped her paddle tightly, her mind racing. She knew she had to stay calm and avoid further provoking the shark. Her kayak, though sturdy, felt vulnerable against the raw power of the predator circling her. The bull shark bumped the kayak again, harder this time. Jess struggled to maintain her balance, her heart pounding in her chest. She had read about bull shark's territorial behavior, and she knew that this encounter could quickly turn dangerous. Her peaceful exploration had turned into a fight for survival. As the shark continued to circle, Jess began to paddle slowly towards the shore, trying to appear calm despite the terror gripping her. She kept her eyes on the shark, ready to defend herself if it attacked. The shoreline seemed impossibly far away, and every second felt like an eternity. The shark made another pass, this time bumping the kayak with such force that Jess nearly lost her balance. She used her paddle to push the shark away, a desperate move to keep it at bay. The shark, undeterred, continued its aggressive behavior, circling closer with each pass. Jess knew she had to act quickly if she wanted to make it out of this encounter unscathed. With every stroke of her paddle, Jess felt the weight of the shark's presence, its predatory instincts honed by millions of years of evolution. The water, once a source of tranquility, now felt like a battleground. Jess's muscles burned with the effort of paddling, but she pushed on, driven by the instinct to survive. The bull shark's aggression intensified as Jess paddled furiously towards the shore. Each time the shark bumped her kayak, it sent waves of fear through her. The kayak rocked violently, and Jess had to use all her strength to stay upright. She knew that if she capsized, she would be even more vulnerable to an attack. The shore, though still distant, was her only hope of escape. Jess's mind raced as she tried to remember everything she knew about bull sharks. They were known to be highly territorial and unpredictable, especially when they felt threatened. She had to stay calm and focused, using her paddle as both a means of propulsion and a weapon. She struck the water near the shark, hoping to scare it off. But the shark seemed undeterred, its predatory instincts overriding any fear. As Jess paddled, the shark made a sudden aggressive move, striking the side of her kayak with tremendous force. The impact nearly knocked her overboard, and Jess had to use all her strength to keep from capsizing. The kayak spun slightly, throwing her off course and further away from the safety of the shore. Jess felt a surge of panic but forced herself to remain composed. She couldn't afford to lose control now. The shark circled again, this time coming even closer. Jess could see its dark shape beneath the surface, moving with terrifying speed and precision. She swung her paddle at the shark, hitting it on the nose. The shark veered away momentarily, but it was clear that it was not deterred. Jess's arms ached from the effort, but she continued to paddle, her determination fueled by the will to survive. As the shark closed in for another strike, Jess braced herself, gripping her paddle tightly. The shark hit the kayak again, harder this time, causing the kayak to tilt dangerously. Jess fought to maintain her balance her breath coming in ragged gasps. The shark's eyes, cold and calculating, were fixed on her, and she could feel its predatory energy. In a desperate attempt to protect herself, Jess swung her paddle with all her might, aiming for the shark's gills. The paddle connected with a solid thud, and the shark recoiled, momentarily stunned. Jess seized the opportunity to paddle with renewed vigor, her arms burning with the effort. The shore was still a distant goal, but she could see it more clearly now, a beacon of hope in the chaos. The bull shark, undeterred by the blow, resumed its aggressive circling. Jess knew she had to stay focused and not let fear overwhelm her. Each stroke of the paddle brought her closer to safety, but the shark's relentless pursuit made every second feel like an eternity. The water churned around her, a maelstrom of fear and desperation. As Jess neared the shallows, the shark made one final desperate lunge at her kayak. The impact was so powerful that it nearly knocked her out of the boat. Jess clung to the sides of the kayak, her knuckles white with the effort. The shark's teeth scraped against the bottom of the kayak, a chilling reminder of the predator's power. With a final desperate push, Jess paddled into the shallows. The shark, unable to follow her into the shallow water, circled one last time before retreating into the depths. Jess collapsed in her kayak, her body trembling with exhaustion and relief. She had made it to safety, but the ordeal had left her shaken to the core. As she dragged her kayak onto the shore, Jess's mind replayed the encounter in vivid detail. 
the bull shark's aggressive behavior had been a stark reminder of the ocean's unpredictable nature. The serene beauty of the mangroves had given way to a fierce struggle for survival, and Jess knew she would never forget the lessons learned that day. Jess sat on the shore, her kayak beside her, and took a moment to gather her thoughts. She had faced one of nature's most formidable predators and survived. In the heart of the Amazon basin, the lush jungle teemed with life on every level. It was June 12, 2008, and a team of biologists had set up camp near a remote tributary of the Amazon River in Brazil. The dense forest, alive with the sounds of wildlife, provided an ideal backdrop for their research. Their mission was to study the aquatic ecosystem, cataloging the diverse species that thrived in the murky waters. The team comprised four members, Dr. Laura Collins, the lead biologist, Ethan Parker, a seasoned diver, Sophie Bennett, a young researcher passionate about aquatic life, and Sam Reed, an experienced diver and photographer. They had spent the morning preparing their equipment and discussing the day's objectives, eager to explore the underwater world. The waters of the Amazon basin were known to harbor a variety of dangerous creatures, including the electric eel. These eels could deliver shocks of up to 600 volts, enough to stun or even kill a human. While the team was aware of the risks, their enthusiasm for discovery outweighed their fears. They had taken all necessary precautions, but the unpredictable nature of the Amazon's waters was always a concern. As the sun climbed higher, casting dappled light through the thick canopy, the team donned their diving gear and entered the water. The tributary, though murky and filled with debris, promised a wealth of information. Laura led the way, followed by Ethan, Sophie, and Sam, each equipped with cameras and collection tools. The underwater world was a realm of shadows and hidden beauty. Schools of fish darted around and plants swayed gently in the current. The team moved slowly, careful not to disturb the delicate environment. They were focused and their senses were attuned to every movement and sound. Sam, eager to capture the perfect shot, ventured slightly ahead of the group. His camera flashed as he documented the intricate details of the underwater flora and fauna. In his excitement, he failed to notice the large electric eel nestled among the rocks. The eel, feeling threatened by the intrusion, began to display signs of agitation. Without warning, the eel lunged, delivering a powerful electric shock directly to Sam. The impact was immediate and devastating. Sam's body convulsed, his muscles seizing up as the electric current surged through him. He lost consciousness, his limp form drifting in the water. The flash of the camera and the sudden commotion caught the attention of the rest of the team. Laura, Ethan, and Sophie turned in alarm, their hearts pounding as they saw Sam's body floating lifelessly. Panic surged through them, but training and instinct quickly took over. Laura motioned for Ethan and Sophie to stay back as she swam toward Sam, her mind racing with the need to act swiftly. The murky water made visibility poor and the eel, still agitated, remained a threat. Laura reached Sam and checked for signs of life. His pulse was weak and he was unresponsive. She grabbed him, pulling him towards the surface with all her strength. The eel, sensing another intruder, delivered another shock, this time to Laura. Pain shot through her, but she fought to maintain her grip on Sam. Ethan and Sophie, watching in horror, knew they had to help. Ethan signaled Sophie to stay close as he swam towards Laura and Sam. The water around them seemed to churn with danger, and every movement was a potential trigger for another attack. Ethan reached them, and together, he and Laura struggled to bring Sam to the surface. As they broke through the surface, gasping for air, they saw the distant outline of their boat. The eel's shock had left them both disoriented and weak, but they knew they couldn't afford to stop. They signaled Sophie, who had stayed near the boat, to come closer and help. Sophie, seeing Laura and Ethan struggling with Sam, paddled the boat towards them as quickly as she could. The water around them felt ominous, the threat of the electric eel ever-present. Sophie's heart raced as she reached out to help pull Sam aboard. Together, they lifted his unconscious body into the boat, their muscles straining with the effort. Once Sam was safely in the boat, Laura and Ethan scrambled aboard, their bodies still tingling from the eel's shocks. Laura immediately began administering first aid, checking Sam's vitals and ensuring he was breathing. His pulse was faint, but he was alive. They had to act fast to prevent any further complications from the electric shock. 
The team knew they had to get Sam back to camp, where they had better medical supplies. Sophie started the boat's engine and they sped towards the shore, the water churning behind them. The urgency of the situation hung heavy in the air, each second feeling like an eternity. As they neared the shore, the dense jungle loomed ahead, a stark contrast to the chaos they had just experienced. The team's camp was a short distance from the water's edge. They reached it quickly, carrying Sam to the medical tent with care. Laura and Ethan worked together, using their training to stabilize him and monitor his condition. The minutes stretched on as they waited for Sam to regain consciousness. The jungle around them buzzed with life, but within the tent it felt as though time had slowed to a crawl. Finally, Sam began to stir, his eyelids fluttering open. He was disoriented but alive, and the team let out a collective sigh of relief. While Sam rested, the team took a moment to reflect on the ordeal. The Amazon basin, with its beauty and mystery, had revealed its dangerous side. The electric eel's powerful shock had almost cost them a friend and colleague. They knew they had been lucky, and the experience underscored the need for greater caution in their work. In the summer of 2006, the wild and remote coast of Alaska was the scene for a guided kayak tour. On June 15th, a group of tourists gathered near Sitka, ready to embark on an adventure through the cold waters. The sky was clear, the air crisp, and spirits were high. The group consisted of Sarah Thompson, an adventurous traveler, Mark Davis, a nature enthusiast, Jenna Lee, a photographer, and Kevin Patel, a novice kayaker. Their guide, Jake Williams, was an experienced kayaker with a deep knowledge of the local wildlife. The Alaskan coast was home to a variety of marine life, including the powerful stellar sea lion. These animals could weigh up to 2,500 pounds and were known for their territorial behavior, especially the males. Encounters with these sea lions could be unpredictable, particularly during the mating season when the bulls were on high alert. The tour started smoothly as the group paddled out enjoying the scenic views of towering cliffs and dense forests. The water was calm and the group moved leisurely, taking in the beauty of the untouched wilderness. Sarah and Mark chatted excitedly, pointing out different birds and sea otters they saw along the way. Jenna was busy capturing the stunning landscape with her camera while Kevin paddled nervously but kept close to Jake, who led the way. As they rounded a rocky outcrop, the group spotted a large colony of sea lions basking on the sun-warmed rocks. The sight was mesmerizing. Dozens of sea lions lay sprawled out, their sleek bodies glistening in the sunlight. Jake signaled for the group to keep a safe distance, and they quietly observed the animals, careful not to disturb them. The sea lions seemed at ease, some lazily stretching while others barked and played in the water. The tourists were captivated by the scene enjoying this rare glimpse into the lives of these impressive creatures. Jake explained the behavior of the sea lions, sharing his knowledge with the group, who listened intently. Among the colony was a large bull sea lion, clearly the dominant male. He watched the kayakers with a wary eye, his massive head lifting occasionally to sniff the air. The bull's presence commanded respect, and Jake reminded the group to remain calm and avoid making sudden movements. The group continued to observe the sea lions, unaware that their presence was starting to agitate the bull. Suddenly, the bull sea lion let out a deep, resonant roar, a clear warning. The peaceful atmosphere shifted as the bull perceived the kayaks as a threat to his territory. Before anyone could react, the bull lunged into the water, swimming directly toward the group with alarming speed. The bull sea lion's sudden charge sent a wave of panic through the group. The massive animal rammed into Kevin's kayak first, capsizing it and sending him into the frigid water. The impact was powerful and Kevin struggled to stay afloat, the shock of the cold water taking his breath away. Sarah and Mark tried to paddle away, but the bull was relentless. It circled back, ramming into Mark's kayak next, flipping it over with ease. Mark surfaced, gasping for air, his face a mix of fear and determination. Jenna, too, was targeted. Her kayak wobbled precariously before the bull struck it, tossing her into the water. Jake remained calm under pressure, quickly assessing the situation. He knew they needed to regroup and find a way to reach the shore safely. The sea lion's aggression showed no signs of waning, and every second in the water increased the risk of hypothermia. 
Jake paddled towards Kevin, reaching him just in time to help him stay above the water. He directed Kevin to hold on to the kayak. Kevin grabbed the edge, shivering but holding on tight. Jake then made his way to Mark and Jenna, who were doing their best to stay afloat amidst the chaos. He signaled for them to form a circle around his kayak. The group managed to gather around Jake, using his kayak as a makeshift raft. The bull sea lion continued to circle, its powerful body cutting through the water with ease. It made several more attempts to strike, but the tight formation seemed to confuse it. The sea lion's frustration was palpable, but Jake knew they couldn't let their guard down. Slowly, they began to paddle towards the shore, every movement calculated to avoid further provoking the bull. The journey was agonizingly slow, the cold water sapping their strength. The bull made another aggressive pass, splashing water over them. But Jake's calm instructions kept the group focused. After what felt like an eternity, they neared the rocky shore. The bull, sensing defeat, let out a final angry roar before retreating to the colony. Exhausted and relieved, the group struggled onto the rocks, their bodies shaking from the cold and adrenaline. The memory of the aggressive bull sea lion would stay with them forever, a powerful reminder of the raw, untamed nature of the world they had come to explore. And though the experience had been harrowing, it had also deepened their respect for the wild and their understanding of the delicate balance between human curiosity and the natural world's unpredictable forces. In the clear, warm waters off the coast of the Bahamas, Eli Novak was experiencing one of the most beautiful days of his life. It was June 15, 2009, and he had taken a trip to a small island called Coral Cay, renowned for its vibrant reefs and diverse marine life. Eli, an avid snorkeler, had been looking forward to this trip for months. Coral Cay was a haven for snorkelers and divers, offering a window into a world teeming with colorful fish, coral formations, and an array of sea creatures. Eli had spent the morning exploring the shallow reefs near the shore. The sun was high in the sky, casting a golden hue over the crystal clear water. Schools of fish darted around him, and the coral reefs below were a riot of color and movement. He felt a sense of peace and awe, floating weightlessly in the warm water, completely immersed in the underwater paradise. Eli wore his usual snorkeling gear, fins, a mask, a snorkel, and a sleek dive watch. The watch, a gift from his father, was a prized possession, not just for its functionality, but also for its sentimental value. Little did Eli know the glint of the watch in the sunlight would soon attract unwanted attention. Barracudas were common in the waters around Coral Cay. These sleek, torpedo-shaped fish were known for their speed and sharp teeth. They were usually curious but could become aggressive if they felt threatened or were attracted to shiny objects. Locals often warned snorkelers and divers to avoid wearing jewelry or anything reflective. But Eli, in his excitement, had forgotten this crucial advice. After several hours of snorkeling, Eli decided to venture a bit further from the shore to explore a particularly vibrant section of the reef he had spotted earlier. He swam slowly, taking in the sights, the tranquility of the underwater world enveloping him. The water was warm and clear, the sunlight creating dancing patterns on the sandy bottom. He felt completely at ease, unaware of the danger that lurked nearby. As Eli floated above the reef, marveling at a school of parrotfish nibbling on the coral, he noticed a sudden change in the water's ambiance. The smaller fish scattered, and an eerie silence fell over the reef. Eli's heart began to race as he sensed something was wrong. He turned his head and saw a large silvery shape gliding towards him. It was a barracuda, its long, slender body moving with effortless grace. The barracuda's eyes locked onto Eli, and he could see the creature's sharp teeth glinting in the sunlight. The fish seemed to be fixated on his dive watch, the metallic gleam drawing it closer. Eli's heart pounded in his chest as he realized the potential danger. He had heard stories of barracudas being attracted to shiny objects, mistaking them for prey, but he had never imagined he would find himself in such a situation. The barracuda continued to circle him, its movements quick and deliberate. Eli tried to remain calm, knowing that sudden movements could provoke an attack. He kept his eyes on the fish, trying to gauge its intentions. The once peaceful swim had turned into a tense standoff, and Eli knew he needed to think quickly to avoid a dangerous encounter. He slowly began to back away, keeping his movements smooth and deliberate. 
The Barracuda followed, maintaining a constant distance, its eyes never leaving the glinting watch. Eli's mind raced as he tried to come up with a plan. The shore seemed miles away, and he knew he had to stay calm and avoid panic if he wanted to make it back safely. The minutes felt like hours as Eli carefully maneuvered through the water, the Barracuda's presence a constant threat. He tried to recall everything he knew about these predators, hoping to find a way to deter the fish without provoking it. The underwater world that had seemed so welcoming just moments ago now felt like a perilous maze, with each movement calculated to avoid triggering an attack. The tension in the water was palpable as Eli continued his slow retreat. The Barracuda's eyes remained fixed on him, its body moving with a predatory grace. Eli's mind was a whirlwind of fear and strategy. He knew that Barracudas were known for their sudden bursts of speed and their sharp, needle-like teeth. Any wrong move could trigger an attack. Eli kept his movements smooth and controlled, trying to create as little disturbance as possible. The shore seemed impossibly far, but he focused on each small movement, inching his way closer to safety. The Barracuda followed, its interest in the shiny watch undiminished. Eli's heart pounded in his chest, each beat a reminder of the danger he was in. As Eli swam, he noticed a cluster of rocks ahead. He decided to use them as a potential barrier between himself and the Barracuda. Slowly, he moved towards the rocks, careful not to make any sudden movements. The Barracuda's eyes tracked him, but it didn't change its course. Eli reached the rocks and positioned himself behind them, hoping the barrier would obscure the glint of the watch. For a moment, it seemed to work. The Barracuda circled the rocks, its interest waning. Eli took a deep breath, his body trembling with tension. He waited, hoping the fish would lose interest and swim away. But then the Barracuda darted around the rocks, coming face to face with Eli once more. Its eyes locked onto the watch, and Eli knew he had to act fast. With no other options, Eli decided to try a bold move. He quickly unfastened the watch and tossed it a few feet away. The shiny object caught the Barracuda's attention, and the fish darted towards it. Seizing the opportunity, Eli swam as fast as he could towards the shore. His heart raced, adrenaline pumping through his veins as he put distance between himself and the Barracuda. Eli could feel the strain in his muscles as he swam with all his might. The shore was still a distance away, but he pushed on, driven by the will to survive. He glanced back and saw the Barracuda circling the watch, its interest momentarily diverted. He knew he couldn't slow down. Any hesitation could be disastrous. The water around Eli churned with his frantic movements, but he forced himself to stay focused. Each stroke brought him closer to the shore, the promise of safety spurring him on. He could see the outline of the boat he had come from, a beacon of hope in the tumultuous sea. The distance seemed to shrink, but not fast enough for his racing heart. As Eli neared the boat, he saw his friend Sarah waving frantically from the deck. She had noticed his distress and was calling out to him, though her words were lost in the chaos of the moment. Eli swam harder, his arms and legs burning with exertion. The Barracuda was still circling the watch, but he knew it wouldn't stay distracted for long. With one final burst of energy, Eli reached the boat. Sarah leaned over, grabbing his arms and helping him scramble aboard. He collapsed onto the deck, his body shaking with exhaustion and relief. The Barracuda, now far behind, continued to circle the discarded watch, unaware that its intended prey had escaped. Eli lay on the deck, catching his breath and processing the ordeal he had just survived. The once serene waters of Coral Cay had turned into a battlefield, and he had emerged victorious, albeit shaken. As the boat headed back to shore, Eli reflected on the day's events. The encounter had been terrifying, but it had also reinforced his love for the ocean and its inhabitants. He would continue to explore the underwater world, but with a heightened awareness and respect for the creatures that called it home. The Barracuda's sharp teeth and lightning-fast movements would remain etched in his memory, a reminder of the ocean's power and the importance of vigilance in its depths. In 2009, Emily Collins, a 28-year-old from Portland, Oregon, decided to take a much-needed break from her hectic life. She booked a vacation to Hawaii, a place she had always dreamed of visiting. Known for its pristine beaches, crystal-clear waters, and abundant marine life, Hawaii was the perfect getaway for someone like Emily, who had a deep love for the ocean. On the second day of her trip, 
she decided to explore the waters off the coast of Kauai, a place renowned for its coral reefs and the gentle giants of the sea, manta rays. Manta rays were known for their graceful movements and calm demeanor, often seen gliding through the water as if they were flying. Emily had read about them and seen countless pictures, and she was eager to witness these creatures up close. The locals assured her that manta rays were harmless and more interested in plankton than in humans. Armed with her snorkeling gear, Emily made her way to a popular spot where manta rays were often seen. The weather was perfect, with the sun shining brightly overhead and the ocean stretching out like a vast blue carpet. As Emily swam further out, she marveled at the underwater world beneath her. Schools of colorful fish darted in and out of coral formations, and the sunlight filtered through the water, creating a mesmerizing dance of light and shadow. After about an hour of swimming, Emily noticed a large shadow gliding beneath her. Her heart skipped a beat as she realized it was a manta ray. The creature was enormous, its wingspan reaching nearly 20 feet. It moved with an effortless grace, seemingly unbothered by the world around it. Emily was captivated. She had never seen anything so beautiful. Curious and excited, Emily decided to dive down for a closer look. She took a deep breath and submerged herself, kicking towards the manta ray. As she drew nearer, she could see its large eyes and the distinctive cephalic fins on either side of its head, which it used to funnel plankton into its mouth. The manta ray seemed peaceful, and Emily felt a sense of awe as she hovered a few feet above it. However, what Emily didn't know was that this particular manta ray had become increasingly agitated by the constant presence of tourists. It had been harassed before, with people trying to touch it or swim too close, and it had started to associate humans with danger. As Emily got closer, the manta ray sensed her presence and, feeling threatened, began to change its behavior. The ray suddenly stopped gliding and started to thrash its massive wings. The water around Emily churned violently as the manta ray attempted to ward off what it perceived as a threat. The powerful currents created by the ray's movements caught Emily off guard, pulling her downward and away from the surface. The force was so strong that it knocked the air out of her lungs, and she struggled to regain her bearings. Panic set in as Emily realized she was being dragged deeper into the water. The serene encounter she had imagined had turned into a terrifying struggle for survival. She kicked her legs and tried to swim upwards, but the manta ray's thrashing wings made it nearly impossible to break free. Each powerful stroke of the ray's wings sent her spinning, disoriented and desperate for air. Emily's lungs burned as she fought to reach the surface. She was losing strength and the fear of drowning loomed large in her mind. She glanced upwards and saw the light of the surface growing dimmer, the manta ray's massive body blocking her path. The creature showed no signs of stopping, its large body creating a whirlpool effect that pulled Emily closer to its deadly embrace. As she struggled, Emily felt a sharp pain in her side as the manta ray's wing brushed against her with surprising force. The impact left her dazed, and she could feel her consciousness slipping away. But the thought of her family, her parents, her younger sister waiting for her back home, gave her the strength to keep fighting. Summoning every last bit of energy, Emily twisted her body and pushed herself away from the manta ray with all her might. She managed to break free from the vortex and started to swim towards the light above. The ascent felt agonizingly slow, her body screaming for oxygen but she forced herself to keep going. Finally, Emily's head broke through the surface and she gasped for air, the salty water stinging her throat. She could hear distant voices, faint but growing louder. Turning her head, she saw a boat approaching rapidly. It was the tour group she had joined earlier, alerted by the commotion in the water. The guide, a local man named Kimo, reached out to her, and with his help, Emily managed to climb aboard the boat, her body shaking from exhaustion and fear. As the boat sped back to shore, Emily lay on the deck trying to process what had just happened. The manta ray, once a creature of beauty in her eyes, had become a symbol of the unpredictable dangers of the ocean. She had come face to face with a powerful force of nature, and it had almost cost her life. Back on land, Emily was treated for minor injuries and shock. She spent the rest of her vacation away from the water, her love for the ocean tempered by a newfound respect for its inhabitants. The experience had left her shaken, but it also deepened her understanding of the delicate balance between humans and the natural world. 
Emily's encounter with the aggressive manta ray was a stark reminder that even the most seemingly gentle creatures can become dangerous when provoked or threatened. She would never forget the sheer power of the manta ray's wings or the feeling of being dragged into the depths. And though she would eventually return to the ocean, she would always carry with her the memory of that day in Hawaii when she came too close to one of the ocean's giants. In the warm waters off the coast of Australia, near the fictional coastal town of Coral Bay, the sun was shining brightly on March 12, 2003. The ocean was a stunning shade of blue, clear and inviting. Coral Bay was known for its vibrant coral reefs and diverse marine life, attracting divers and snorkelers from all over the world. Sam Harrington, a 28-year-old free diver, was one of those drawn to the beauty of Coral Bay. An experienced diver, Sam loved the sense of freedom and tranquility he found beneath the waves. With him on this dive was his best friend and dive partner, Jake Lawson, a seasoned diver in his mid-30s who had been diving with Sam for years. Their day began early, with the two friends preparing their gear at the small dive shop they frequented. Sam checked his equipment meticulously, ensuring everything was in perfect working order. He had a deep respect for the ocean and its unpredictable nature. Jake, with his easygoing demeanor, joked around but was equally diligent with his preparations. They were also joined by two other divers, Mia Thompson, a marine biology student researching coral reef ecosystems, and her friend, Eric Johnson, an underwater photographer capturing the beauty of the reefs for a magazine. The four of them made a diverse and lively group, each bringing their own unique skills and perspectives to the dive. After a quick breakfast and a final equipment check, they boarded a small boat and headed out to one of the lesser-known reef spots. The boat ride was filled with laughter and anticipation, with everyone eager to explore the underwater world. As they neared their destination, the water's clarity revealed the stunning coral formations below. Sam and Jake were the first to dive in, followed closely by Mia and Eric. The underwater scene was breathtaking. Schools of colorful fish darted among the corals, and the light filtered down from the surface, creating a magical, otherworldly glow. Sam felt a sense of peace as he glided through the water, every stroke bringing him closer to the vibrant marine life he loved so much. Australia's waters were home to many fascinating creatures, but one of the most intriguing and dangerous was the blue-ringed octopus. Though small, its bright blue rings warned of its potent venom, which could cause paralysis and even death. These octopuses were a rare sight, and divers often considered it a lucky encounter to see one, if they kept a respectful distance. Sam had heard stories about the blue-ringed octopus, but had never seen one in person. As he explored the reef, he remained vigilant, scanning the corals and crevices for any signs of the elusive creature. Meanwhile, Jake and Eric were engrossed in their tasks, Jake helping Mia with her research and Eric snapping photos of the stunning underwater landscape. The dive continued peacefully, the group moving in harmony with the ocean's gentle currents. Sam's curiosity led him to a particularly vibrant section of the reef, teeming with life. He marveled at the intricate coral formations and the variety of fish swimming around him. It was a perfect day for diving, and he felt a profound connection to the ocean and its inhabitants. As Sam hovered near a cluster of corals, Something caught his eye. A small, colorful creature with bright blue rings slowly emerged from a crevice. His heart skipped a beat as he realized he was looking at a blue-ringed octopus. Fascinated, Sam moved closer to get a better look, careful not to disturb the delicate creature. The octopus, seemingly unaware of Sam's presence, moved gracefully among the corals. Its bright blue rings pulsed with color, a mesmerizing sight. Sam, captivated by the beauty of the tiny creature, inched closer, wanting to capture the moment in his mind forever. Suddenly the octopus turned and lunged at Sam. He felt a sharp sting on his hand, followed by an intense burning sensation. The blue-ringed octopus's bite was quick, its venom delivering a potentially lethal dose of neurotoxin. Panic set in as Sam realized what had happened. His serene dive had turned into a nightmare. The venom began to take effect almost immediately and Sam felt a tingling sensation spreading from his hand. His muscles started to weaken, and he knew he had to get to the surface quickly. Fighting the growing paralysis, Sam kicked hard, propelling himself upward. Jake noticed the commotion and saw Sam struggling. Realizing something was wrong, he swam over as fast as he could. 
Sam's movements were becoming more erratic, his body not responding as it should. Jake grabbed Sam and began to tow him to the surface, his heart pounding with fear. Mia and Eric, alerted by Jake's urgency, followed them to the surface. As they broke through the water, Jake shouted for help, his voice filled with desperation. The boat captain, John, had seen the situation unfolding and was already moving the boat closer to the divers. Sam's breathing was becoming labored, and he struggled to stay conscious. The venom was working its way through his system, causing his muscles to seize and his vision to blur. Jake and John pulled him onto the boat, laying him flat and trying to keep him calm. Mia, who had some medical training, quickly assessed the situation. She knew there was no anti-venom for a blue-ringed octopus bite, and that they had to keep Sam's airway open to prevent him from suffocating. She instructed Jake to help her keep Sam's head stable and his airways clear while John radioed for emergency assistance. The minutes felt like hours as they raced back to shore. Sam's condition was deteriorating rapidly, and he was slipping in and out of consciousness. His friends worked frantically to keep him breathing, their fear and determination evident in their actions. On the beach, an ambulance awaited their arrival. Paramedics quickly took over, administering oxygen and preparing to transport Sam to the nearest hospital. The severity of the situation was clear, and every second counted in getting him the medical care he needed. As the ambulance sped away, Jake, Mia, and Eric were left to process what had just happened. Their day of adventure had turned into a life-and-death struggle, highlighting the unpredictable and dangerous nature of the ocean's creatures.